the hell's wrong with you, Banerjee? <laughs> like you're putting out these big financial plans and giving people like choice about how you want to pay and you're being transparent and stuff. Welcome to episode 24 of the Canadian Couch Potato Podcast, where we help you become a better investor with index funds and ETFs. I'm Dan Bordelotti. We're going to kick off this episode with an interview with Preet Banerjee, a name you're probably familiar with if you've spent any time at all in the online personal finance community in Canada. I've known Preet for many years now. When I launched the Canadian Couch Potato blog back in 2010, he had already been blogging for about three years at wheredoesallmymoneygo.com. By the way, if you're looking for that site today, it's been rebranded as bondsareforlosers.com. And in case it wasn't obvious, that's meant ironically. Now, Preet spent several years as an investment advisor early in his career, but he eventually became disillusioned in that role, and he's since become an outspoken advocate for Canadian investors in many contexts. He's a media personality who appears regularly on CBC's The National, a sought-after public speaker. He's the author of an excellent book, Stop Overthinking Your Money, the creator of the Mostly Money podcast, a director of Fair Canada, which is a nonprofit group that lobbies for investors' rights, and an entrepreneur who recently launched a service called Money Gaps, designed to assist financial advisors in improving the financial planning that they offer to their clients. Somehow, Preet has also managed to spend the last several years doing doctoral research at the University of Toronto, with a focus on the financial services industry in Canada. Preet and I recently had a chance to sit down in the studio with two microphones and one bottle of scotch to chat about his research and his thoughts on the plight of the Canadian investor. And a note to my compliance department, that scotch was consumed after hours. And joining me here in the studio is Preet Banerjee. Preet, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Dan, for having me. It's my pleasure. I've always wanted to be on your podcast. Well, this is your uh, rare pleasure to enjoy. So, <laughs> all right. Um, we have a lot to talk about today, and I wanted to start by just asking you to share a little bit about your background. You have a very uh, unusual career path, I think, that you followed over the last however many years. Tell us a little bit about how you started in the financial industry and how you got to where you are today. Sure. Yeah. The Coles notes is that my undergrad degree was in neuroscience. Then I went to auto racing school and then I ended up in finance. So cliche. <laughs> <laughs> but that is literally how it happened. So when I was studying neuroscience in, um, in university, I found it really fascinating, but I didn't want to pursue that as a career. And as I was about three quarters of the way through that degree, a friend of mine took me to a, a racing event, a totally sanctioned racing event, not anything like street racing or anything like that. And I got bit by the bug really hard. And so I was obsessed with racing and there was this auto racing school that you could enroll in. So right after my last exam, I ended up going to the Bridgestone Racing Academy just outside of Toronto, Ontario. And I trained there for a year uh, to become a professional race car driver. Failed miserably, ran out of money. I was way too old. <laughs> and I ended up working at the school as the operations manager. And the racing school had three main lines of revenue people who wanted to become professional race car drivers, hobbyists who wanted to try the experience of driving a race car, and corporate entertainment. And because it was so close to Toronto, the main customers for the, the corporate entertainment were Bay Street brokerages. And so I met a lot of people on Bay Street, and this one guy who went there not only for corporate entertainment, but also because he wanted to get his own license, uh, we became friends. And he said, you know, when you're done wasting your time, I think you should come work for me in my world. And so that's how I got pulled into the world of finance. I had no financial training whatsoever. And uh, you know, my dad was a physician. It was like, you know, a good Indian boy is going to become a doctor, right? <laughs> so that was always the plan. I didn't even know it was an option to do something else until this guy came along. So that pulled me into the world of personal finance. And originally, the plan was for me to become a biotech stock analyst. So take the CFA, take my neuroscience background, start looking at modeling stock prices for biotech companies. And then when I was going to do that, he ended up retiring at like 36, this guy who pulled me out of the racing world. And so I didn't have a place to neatly tuck into. So I ended up looking at personal finance and financial advising. So I was an advisor, a mutual fund sales rep to begin with. Then I moved to a brokerage, I was a full service broker um, at Scotia McLeod. And uh, that's how I got into finance. That's a very Coles Nose version of it. 
Now, you were also among what I would call, say, the first generation of personal finance bloggers in Canada, yeah. uh, despite your youth. Um, youth. You've been doing this <laughs> uh, for a long time. I mean, what year did you launch the blog? It must have been like 06, 07 or something Yeah, it was like 07, that. July 23rd, 2007. I don't know why I still remember that mm-hmm. date. But um, yeah, so that was before the collapse, right? And yes. um, it was so early in the world of blogging. So at the time, I was at McLeod. And I have to tell you the story that involves John Chevro, um, because this was a real fork in my career moment. So to try and build credibility, I wrote this book on RRSPs because I realized there was no actual book that really explained RRSPs. There were books that talked about it in like a chapter or two as a throwaway, but there wasn't really a book. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to be known as the guy who literally wrote the book on RRSPs? So that's what I set out to do, and I did it on my blog. In any case, when the book was done, and it's all actually available on the blog because every chapter is a different blog post and there's 41 chapters. When the book was done, I shopped it around to a bunch of financial journalists, one of them being Jonathan Chevro, who at the time was at the National Post, Financial Post, and said, we want to run excerpts. And I thought, that's fantastic. And he said, "Uh, can you drop off a copy at the office? I'm like, it's right down the road. I'm happy to drive it right over personally. And he said, oh, well, while you're here, why don't we do an interview? And so we sat down and we talked about the book, turns off the tape recorder. And I'm thinking, all right, we're buddies now, right? I'm in it. And then he says, uh, so what kind of mutual funds do you buy for your clients? And, um, and I said, Jonathan, I don't, I don't focus on buying mutual funds. I just buy the index and focus on where the real alpha is for an advisor and that's in the planning. Um, so a couple of days later, they sent a photographer over to take my picture and everything. I thought this is amazing. I get this amazing coverage. And uh, I looked at the paper when it was finally published and it was like a three quarter page interview. Like the shot was massive. It was a big article, but the headline (laughs) said, new breed of advisors shuns mutual funds. (laughs) So let's just put this into context. At the time I was at Scotia McLeod. And if I remember correctly, the quarterly revenues from mutual funds was a few hundred million dollars. So my phone started to ring off the hook. And half of it was people from inside saying, you know, what were you thinking? Why did you say these things? I got a call from the head of, or maybe not the head, but someone from corporate public affairs. And I picked up the phone and she said who she was. And I was like, yeah, listen, I did not intend for that to be the message. She's like, yeah, we kind of figured, you know, try not to talk to the media going forward. So I had a couple more interviews lined up for the rest of the week. And and when I told her that, I heard this big sigh on the other end of the phone. She's like, okay, <laughs> we're going to send over an emergency media training consultant tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. And we're going to make sure that if you're going to do these interviews, at least you know what you can and cannot say. So I did this training and it actually went really well. And there was someone from public affairs who was there to sort of monitor. And she said, you know what? Now that we know you're not a complete idiot, We're going to actually line up more interviews for you. So this was a real fork in the career uh, moment for me, as I said, because the other half of the calls were all people who are saying, I want you to be my advisor. Because what they saw was something that is something that you definitely wouldn't see back then, and that is people being able to speak their mind. Now, tying this back into the blogging. So now I had built up this relationship with the marketing arm of Scotia and whatnot. And uh, they said, all right, so now you know what you can and can't really do, right? What's onside and what's offside. And I said, oh, so I guess I should tell you I have a blog. And they're like, what's a blog? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, it's where I just write whatever I'm thinking of and publish it without any oversight whatsoever. They're like, oh, yeah, no, you can't do that. And so the, the marketing person that I was working with, they were pretty cool. And they actually said, all right, you know what? Uh, we're going to make you a deal. Now that we know that you kind of have some training and you know what is you know what is acceptable and what isn't, we're going to make a special uh, exception for you. And that is you can publish whatever you want, whenever you want. But if you think it's something that we would find contentious, just run it by us first. So I have to say, that was pretty forward thinking at the time because for the next 10 years after that, you could not have a blog as a financial advisor in the There's industry. no way that would fly today at any financial Even institution. Even today, huh? Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. So, so yeah. So that was the start of the blog. A very long-winded answer to your question. Now you have done a lot since you left uh, the financial advisory business. Uh, you've worked as a financial consultant to um, financial institutions, and you've had a very successful career as a public speaker and an author. Um, but you recently, uh, or maybe not so recently, it's been a couple of years now that since you went back to school. Um, so tell us a little bit about what prompted you to uh, go back to do a graduate degree and uh, tell us about the focus of your research. Yeah. So, you know, when I was in the industry, I was very skeptical of a lot of the things that I saw. So, you know, the idea of quotas, uh, the idea of commissions, the seemingly, you know, people thought that, oh yeah, a lot of people will work in the best interests of clients. And a lot of consumers thought, yeah, that must be the way it is that these financial advisors are acting in my best interest. And yet you're paying predominantly at the time, commissions were the main compensation model, which is the structural conflict of interest. And that never really sat well with me. And um, so this was always something that was, you know, seated in my mind that I, I just can't reconcile how this works. I know there's a lot of people with good intentions in the industry, but there's just something not right about the status quo. And I've met a lot of great financial advisors and I've met a lot of horrific financial advisors. And that's the problem because if you are of an average financial consumer and you walk into you know, your typical financial institution, how do you know you've got a good one or a bad one? You simply don't. And I think that's a travesty really, especially for an industry that you know, really says, hey, we're all professionals. This is a profession just like being a doctor or an engineer. That is not even close to being true. So to compare us, this industry to uh, engineers and uh, physicians is a misnomer, but I think a lot of people on the other end or the other side of the desk may not see that because of the giant marketing machine that exists. So that was kind of the impetus behind my research, which is quantifying the uh, the value of financial advice across different delivery channels, specifically in Canada, to figure out where is the value in relationships between financial advisors and consumers to try and make a change in the industry uh, because things need to change. Yeah, we've we've talked about this before kind of casually um, about, you know, the nature of, of the research and some of the findings. And one of the things that you had mentioned, it's something that I've certainly seen in my time in the industry as well, is just this enormous uh, range of uh, services that have the same name. In other words, if you hire a full service financial advisor and you pay a certain fee, you know, you might expect a certain level of service. But the fact is you might get somebody anywhere on the spectrum between, you know, a comprehensive financial planner and outstanding portfolio management on one end or absolute crap, somebody who does nothing more than put you in a mutual fund that he looked up on Morningstar and saw a five-star rating and said, <laughs> right. that sounds good. And uh, to use an analogy, it would be like going into a restaurant, you know, or two different people going into two different restaurants and paying the same amount and one getting like Michelin star cooking and the other one getting, you know, street meat that makes them sick. Right. So why is it that in this industry, uh, there isn't a little bit more consistency in the scope and the quality of the service that people receive? Not enough oversight. Um, you know, it's, it's a for-profit industry at the end of the day, and it's about making money, right? And so this, again, is part of the structural conflict of interest. And you and I both know that there's a lot of good people in the industry, predominantly good people by nature, right? there's unfortunately a high level of, quite frankly, incompetence. Um, and that is owing to the low barrier to entry. So again, you know, these self-study courses, that's all you need to be in charge of someone's life savings. That just doesn't make a lot of sense. So if you are gonna say, listen, we're professionals like other professions, and this is kind of part of the research. So um, the research is, um, in theory, five years long. I'm about to start year six. Um, <laughs> it's taken a long time, but it's you know it's eighty thousand, ninety thousand doctoral dissertation. Um, there's a lot of work that's gone into this, and um, there's a lot of rocks that we've turned over, and the barriers to entry are again too low. So one of the hallmarks of professions is that you have master's level programs and doctoral programs uh, available in those disciplines like engineering and medicine. 
You don't really have that, not to a ubiquitous standard when it comes to financial advice. That really doesn't happen. You're starting to see some college level programs for financial planning, but you don't have this rich academic body of knowledge when it comes to financial advice. And so when I take a look at the first part of the research is doing an overarching literature review, trying to identify the gap that needs to be addressed in the literature. And it's pretty clear. You have the academic body of knowledge, which looks at valuing financial advice from a portfolio centric point of view. And they've been doing that for decades, looking at things like rate of return, sharp ratios, do advisors diversify their clients' portfolios more than DIY advisors, et cetera. So that's great. And there's some amazing research that's been done in a portfolio centric view of the world of advice. Then you have the practitioner world, which has been saying, listen, um, we kind of know that the value that's derived from portfolio construction and all that stuff, we're really getting challenged here. And so we need to change our value proposition. So we're now we're doing full service, right? And so that model keeps evolving and the academic body of knowledge hasn't evolved along with the change in the contemporary practices that are out there with the wealth management industry. So the practitioner journals will say, yeah, we've identified there's a gap in that we've moved towards, we're trying to move towards planning centricity but the academic body of knowledge is portfolio centric. And the academic have said, yeah, we haven't kept pace with how the industry has uh, evolved. So there's this glaring gap in that someone needs to find a way to really measure the value of planning as opposed to the portfolio functions of an advisor. And that's kind of the basis for my overall research question. Okay. Because that that is a, a subtlety that I think is lost on a lot of people, including clients as well as advisors. And that is financial planning and investment management can both offer a lot of value for clients, but they're quite different things. So to give you an example of that, think of all the investing blogs and websites that are out there. There are hundreds of thousands of portals online all dedicated towards different investment strategies, uh, investing bloggers, and what have you. You've got some bloggers that focus on debt management and you know how I got of debt and what have you. You have like no insurance bloggers. <laughs> you don't have any estate planning bloggers. You might have a few, but no one reads their <laughs> bloggers, right? It's not very sexy stuff. And so it's kind of a hard thing to sell to people that there's all this value that can be done outside of the portfolio because they're just not interested. They've been brainwashed over a long period of time, decades and decades and decades, that being good with money is making good money on the stock market. It's a very sexy thing. You look at popular culture, the you know Wall Street, uh, the wolf of Wall Street, it's all investments and rate of return. There's nothing that really talks about the stuff that's actually truly important, which is your overall financial well-being. And this is part of where my research um, had to sort of find a way to measure the value of all the different services out there. Because it's very easy to measure value when it comes to the portfolio, but how do you measure the value of estate planning? How do you measure the value of insurance advice and in, in, in a portfolio of insurance? So what we had to do is we basically came up with a, uh, a multi-factor dynamically sensitive model, which means <laughs> – um, Think about, uh, I'll break it down. So multi-factor is there's multiple, multiple factors of wealth. Um, one of them might be disability insurance. And this is a great example to use. So dynamically sensitive means that the importance of that factor is going to change depending on where you are in your financial life. So if you're 64 years old and you don't have disability insurance, it's actually not a big deal, assuming everything else is taken care of because you've got a, a, an RSP, a TFSA, whatever, and you're just one year shy of retirement. So if that plan was on track and all of a sudden you lose your income at age 64, you're not screwed. But if you're 24 years old and you don't have disability insurance and you were to become disabled, you're guaranteed to be broke for the rest of your life, right? So the importance of your disability insurance coverage when you're young is phenomenal. The importance of your disability coverage when you're 64 is trivial. And every factor has its own loading uh, sensitivity. So for example, with uh, portfolio costs, it's not age related, it's size dependent because you can be 25 years old and have inherited 10 million bucks and you could be 64 and just starting to save for the first time ever. And so the importance of your MER is going to be re relative to the size of your portfolio because a 3% MER, which is astronomical on a portfolio of zero when you're just starting to contribute 100 bucks a month is a couple of bucks a year. 
right? So on an absolute basis, it's very low. But a 3% MER on a $10 million portfolio would be criminal, right? You should be thrown in jail for that. Um, so there's so many different aspects that you have to look at, which is why teasing out uh, causality and who who drives value is a really tough thing to answer. Yeah, it, 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 I guess we have. There's so many things that go under this heading of advisor that you know, as you explained, that something like a robo advisor, essentially, their value added is asset allocation. That's what they do, and they do it very well. But there's no other factors in your model probably that they're hitting. But part of the problem I think for for clients of these advisors is. They're not really sure what factors are the most important because, you know, the, the um, value proposition has never really been presented to them in that way. I mean, certainly I've spoken with clients who have come to us solely because they're interested in the investment strategy. And they say, you know, I don't, I don't need planning or I don't, not interested in. And what <laughs> we've found out is it's just that they've never had it before. Right. And then in almost every case, after the first few months working with us, we stop having very many investment conversations at all because in many ways, the portfolio management, the investment management is quite a bit easier than financial planning. And the financial planning is what engages people because it has more to do with their lives specifically than simply what investments they hold in their accounts, right? Yeah, so here's an analogy. So from the auto racing world, there's a famous saying that in order to finish first, first you must finish. And so to apply that to world of financial advice, before you can have portfolios, first you have to have planning. I, I firmly believe that your, your relationship with whatever advice channel you choose has to start with planning. The portfolio is part of a solution that helps fulfill that plan. So I think most people look at it backwards. They see it again as the sexy thing and the thing you're supposed to do is have a person to help you with your investments and then figure out all the other stuff later. It's completely backwards. One of the other challenges I think with, with this kind of thing is that the compensation models for advisors, there are some conflict of interest involved. The industry has been talking about it, mostly in the US, about how this compensation model might change to become uh, fairer for investors. So do you want to talk a little bit about other models other than the assets under management model for paying for financial advice and the pros and cons of those differences? Yeah. So I guess what I'll start with is saying that there's no model that's perfect. There's no panacea um, where, you know, fee for service where you charge by the hour and your advice only. Um, I think that is more aligned in general. I think that's a model that should get more attention from people, but people have a problem paying directly, right? So we've talked about, you know, the pain of payment and whatnot. And um, back when I was uh, at Scotia, again, this was 2008, um, I gave people the option, listen, um, you can pay a commission. And if we have a low turnover portfolio, this will be the lowest cost option. We can do a percentage of assets under management. It'll be you know 1% and tearing down as your assets grow, uh, or I can charge you by the hour. And at the time, people were like, what the hell are you doing, right? Like I had a lot of brokers in the office like, the hell's wrong with you, Banerjee? <laughs> like you're putting out these big financial plans and giving people like choice about how to want to pay and you're being transparent and stuff. It was, you're fired. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was tough. And I had to actually have conversations with the head office about how does paying or, or charging someone by the hour hit my compensation grid and, and has this been done before? And there was a handful of people doing it. That was kind of like new ground back then. So I can tell you that every model is not perfect. Um, there's going to be some pros and cons to every single model out there. When you are charging people directly, they feel it, right? And that can actually dissuade them from engaging in more services. So if you're charging, say, a separate fee for financial planning, some people, if they you know, don't see the value in it, they might say, all right, well, let's get sort of like a basic plan. And instead of checking in with you every three years or whenever there's a material change, maybe I'll do it every five or 10 years. And they never really get back to it. And they think I've got a plan and this should be good for the next 40 years. So <laughs> you, you know that any financial plan is good for about a couple of months, right? It always has to be monitored on an ongoing basis. So there's pros and cons with that model. With the commission structure, it's clear. There's a, a huge structural conflict of interest there. Um, the percentage of assets under management model, there's a conflict. There's a disconnection between 
when you think about the advisor's workload, it's pretty heavy up front, right? And then it comes down over time. And if there's a material change in someone's life, there might be a blip, but it's for the most part front loaded. But the compensation that the advisor gets is backloaded. So there are ways to adjust for that. So you can have some aggressive tiering for as assets go, uh, grow, the percent that you charge goes down and a, and a loyalty benefit. So I know the guys at Steady, Steady Hand Funds do something like that, where the longer you're a client with them, the fees also go down irrespective of the asset growth. So I think you're going to start to see more innovations along those lines. And I have heard that there are some fun companies out there who are looking at instead of a just a, a percentage like an MER, they're going to have a uh, percentage plus subscription fee. Um, and I think that we are ultimately going to move more towards subscription-based pricing in general over time. There's going to be a lot of um, transition and growing pains and teething pains with stuff like that. But eventually we'll get there because there, every model has some kind of disconnect between what you're paying for and what you're perceived to be getting. Now, one of the other sort of major trends in the industry has been uh, the importance of technology. I mean, you had talked a little bit earlier in our conversation about how, you know, the the portfolio or the advisor's job has kind of evolved over time from kind of stock jockey to portfolio manager. And that was because... I mean, let's face it, it used to be pretty difficult to build a portfolio because you had to build it from scratch from individual securities, right? I mean, this was before the heyday of mutual funds. Nowadays, building an extraordinarily well-diversified portfolio is not only easy, but it's unbelievably cheap, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you can build with one of these one fund ETF portfolios now, you know, a portfolio that contains thousands of securities from multiple asset classes for 0.2%. So I don't know that portfolio construction and portfolio management is necessarily going to be, or at least asset allocation, is not going to have as much value as it used to because of better products and better technology. But one of the ways that I think is really exciting about how this industry might change in the future is how technology can improve financial planning, because this is really in its infancy. And it's something that you've been involved in very specifically with a project. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? So my own project, so I've launched a fintech myself called Money Gaps, and it's not for your listener. So let's just get that you know on the table right away. It's actually designed as a B2B model for financial advisors. It's really a hybrid advisor platform. So when we look at these multiple factors, essentially what Money Gaps does is it's designed to be high volume, basic financial planning so that people who normally would not have had access to financial planning can actually get it. So people will get a very simple report card because what we found is that at the end of the day, all people really want to know is, well, how am I doing, right? Like, am I on the right track? That's really all they need until they get to a point where they have to get more detailed with their cash flow analysis and retirement income projections. What they really want to know is, am I basically on track to retire if I keep on doing what I'm doing? Do I carry too much debt? Do I have my estate plan in order? Do I have the right amount of life insurance and disability coverage? So each of those categories, you'll get a grade um, using the grade point system that you're familiar with in school. So I get an A to an F on cash flow management, life insurance coverage, disability coverage, estate planning, um, uh, retirement uh, coverage, education savings, and so on. And then you get an overall GPA. So what this allows you to do is to figure out where you're doing. And we're kind of gamifying it because a lot of people want to get straight A's. Right? So when they see how well they're doing, they want to make changes and money gaps will basically prescribe, well, this is what you'd have to change in order to get an A. So one of the problems with compensation models is that, you know, if you eliminate quotas for asset gathering, how do you figure out how to incentivize financial planning, right? And so there are some people who want to incentivize financial planning to promote financial planning, but they haven't figured out, well, what do we measure? So something like money gaps could actually give an enlightened institution um, a mechanism why, by which they could actually incentivize financial planning. You know, just another example of how planning, I think, trumps portfolios, especially for the mass market. Here's a perfect example of how people get so focused on portfolios and rate of returns and stuff like that. If you took someone who was saving uh, $200 per month for 10 years and they you know, put into a high interest savings account earning 1.5%, they'd get about 26,000 bucks after 10 years. If you had someone saving half as much because they thought, well, I just want to put away 100 bucks, to get the same ending amount after 10 years, your rate of return would have to be about 14%, 
right? So forget about saving costs on MERs and stuff like you're not going to find 14% annualized for 10 years with any reliability, right? So what you can see is what actually did the heavy lifting in the outcome there was the savings rate, not the rate of return, not the cost savings. And that's where we get lost. We got to think more planning centric. So I want to round up by uh, talking to you about something that we, you and I think have both struggled with, and that is when people come to you and say, you know, I'm looking for an advisor, I'm looking for help, you know, what should I do? And then you say, well, how much money do you have to invest? And, you know, maybe it's 50000 maybe it's 200000 right? I mean, it's pretty decent sized portfolios. Yeah. And the problem is, you know, most of the best – uh, fee-based advisors with the most comprehensive service and the lowest fees have very high minimums, and they're just not available to the average Canadian. And maybe that person isn't quite ready for a full DIY, right? Maybe they're not quite ready to open a brokerage account and trade their own ETFs. What can those people do to get the kind of advice and planning that they need? Um, what's accessible to them? So this is... An incredibly good question um, that doesn't have a satisfactory answer. You know, I've talked to a lot of people about this common situation where, you know, people contact me all the time, um, hundreds of millions of dollars in assets uh, of people contact me saying, hey, can you manage my money or refer me to someone? And if someone comes to me and they says, hey, I've got 5 million, 10 million bucks, whatever. I can very easily find you someone that I have confidence in. Someone comes to me with 50 grand. I can't give you a a name and I can't give you a checklist that if you follow is going to guarantee that you're going to get a great advisor. I'm not saying that great advisors don't exist that deal with 50,000 bucks or no money or assets that are below seven figures. I'm not saying that they don't exist. I'm just saying that it's so diffuse out there that if someone from Coquitlam says, oh, I need to find someone in my area, unless I know someone individually, which is often the case, I don't know every advisor in Canada, I have no checklist I can give to you that says, if you do these things, you'll be okay. There are checklists out there that exist, but I don't think there are any of them that are actually good enough to give you the confidence to say, yeah, you tick off all these boxes, you're going to be fine. And that I think is an indictment of the structure of the industry, the low barrier to entry, the lack of teeth and regulation, the amount of money from industry that goes against lobbying interests. Uh, So as a uh, disclosure, I'm also a director for Fair Canada, the Foundation for Advancement of Investor Rights. And uh, it's something that we tackle all the time. It's we're just simply outgunned. And I do want to make clear because, you know, over the many years that I've been in the industry and, you know, when I have my blog and I put up my opinions about, um, you know, my criticism of the industry and whatnot, I think a lot of people misunderstand my position. Um, I've had phases where I've had death threats from financial advisors for some of the things that I've written about in the past. And I have a lot of financial advisors who, um, you know, agree with a lot of things that I say. And I'll tell you that a lot of my work has been focusing on getting better outcomes for financial consumers, no matter what channel they go. I'm very agnostic overall about the different types of channels. I think that the pie is so big out there. There's so many different types of financial consumers. There are a lot of people who are going to be great in the DIY channel and it's suitable for them. There are going to be a lot of people that need full service and that channel is going to be suitable for them. They're going to get good value if they find a good advisor and everything in between. So that's part of the problem is that there's so many different channels of advice and there are so many different types of financial consumers that you can't say outright that, all these types of advisors are bad and all these types of channels are good or anything like that. It's so nuanced. Yeah. And it's something that I think that we all have to struggle with. So, I mean, thank you for your continued work in this area and thanks for explaining your uh, research to us. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It is time again for another installment of Bad Investment Advice. This time I want to highlight an article that recently appeared on the Forbes website called Why Most Index Funds and ETFs Are Not Good Investments. How's that for a less than subtle title? Anyway, this article was sent to me by two different listeners, hat tips to Frederick and Ed, both of whom recognize just how misguided it is. But given that the author is an investment advisor himself and that Forbes is a widely read publication, I think it's worth a thorough rebuttal. 
Now, the article makes many of the usual tired arguments, such as index funds are inferior because they don't offer protection when markets fall, as well as the timeless classic, passive investing, quote, guarantees average returns each and every year, and I don't talk with many investors who are comfortable with average returns, close quote. Now, this nonsense has been trotted out since time immemorial. It's not even worth refuting here. You can find articles on my blog and on dozens of other websites that clearly explain why they don't hold up. Instead, I want to show you how this article uses a common technique in the financial industry. That is, taking some seriously biased data compiled by an investment firm, dressing it up as a study, and then suggesting that it provides evidence to support whatever strategy they're trying to sell. In this case, as you can tell from the title of the article, the author wants to demonstrate why active investing is superior to using index funds and ETFs. He starts off by saying, quote, Recently, Fidelity published a study that shows active investment management beat passive in 12 of 18 investment categories, close quote. Now, these categories include sectors such as technology and real estate, as well as investment styles such as small growth stocks and large value stocks. And our credulous author takes this as proof that active outperforms passive in, quote, 67% or two-thirds of all categories, close quote. Now, we're only a couple of paragraphs into this article and there are already so many red flags. So let's begin with the most obvious. The data that he presents here from Fidelity is not a, quote, published study. It's taken from a slide deck that the mutual fund company presented to its clients. When you call something a study, it suggests that there's some academic rigor behind it and presumably some peer review. Selective data gathered by a mutual fund company's marketing department is not a study. And as we'll see, these data, and certainly the Forbes author's conclusions, would not have passed the scrutiny of any objective critic. Let's also consider that the 18 investment categories considered here are described by the author as, quote, all categories. But this is absurd. The list includes the healthcare, technology, energy, and real estate sectors, but there are actually 11 generally recognized economic sectors. In addition to the four just named, these include financials, consumer staples, utilities, and others. Now, these are nowhere to be found in the Fidelity data. Not surprisingly, active funds are said to have significantly outperformed passive in the four sectors that are included. So it does make you wonder whether they also outperformed in the other seven. Unfortunately, the Forbes author didn't think to ask that question. Now we turn to how Fidelity defines what it means by outperformance. For each of the 18 categories, it ascribes a percentage that it calls a batting average. For example, in the category of small value stocks, the batting average of active managers is expressed as 57%. So what exactly does that mean? Well, after reading the fine print, it turns out Fidelity looked at the average return of all the active funds in their analysis over rolling one-year periods, updated monthly. So that means, for example, they considered the average return of the funds for the 12 months ending in July, then the 12 months ending in August, and so on. And then they did the same for the index funds. If the average one-year performance for the active funds outperformed the average passive fund for a given month, that was a win. In the case of small value stocks, they found that active won out in 57% of all months considered. Now, I've looked at a lot of historical data in my time, and I have never seen fund performance measured in this way, using individual months in isolation, rather than longer-term buy-and-hold periods. It reminds me a bit of the special kind of golf tournament known as a skins game. In a skins game, golfers don't play 18 holes and then add up their total number of strokes to determine a winner. Instead, each individual hole is a mini competition. The player who sinks the ball with the fewest number of strokes wins that hole, or skin, and then everyone's score is reset to zero before they tee off again. Whoever wins the most individual holes wins the game. Now, as you can imagine, that winner isn't necessarily the one who needed the fewest number of strokes over the entire 18 holes. So, while a skins game is a fun novelty event, it's hardly a reliable measure of consistent performance in golf. The methodology used by Fidelity in this analysis turns investing into a skins game where you get to reset your rate of return every 30 days. This has no relevance to any real-world investor. If you hold an actively managed fund over five years and it outperforms its benchmark in, say, 34 out of those 60 months, which is a batting average of about 58%, is that important to you? 
If that fund underperformed its benchmark over that entire five-year period, would its success rate in isolated months mean anything at all to you? And if the advisor who sold you that fund argued that its 58% batting average was evidence of outperformance, would you believe her? Well, the author of the Forbes piece not only takes this arbitrary statistic as evidence of the failure of index funds, he goes so far as to imply that active investors can expect outperformance to persist over a lifetime. In the categories where active beat passive according to Fidelity's methodology, the Forbes author says, quote, the excess performance was almost always at least 1%. I know, 1% doesn't sound like a lot, but compounded over a 40-year working career, it adds up to a lot of money, close quote. Yeah, it certainly does, but absolutely nothing in the Fidelity data suggests that active funds should be expected to provide 1% in outperformance compounded over two months, let alone 40 years. I mean, it's hard to overstate just how absurd this leap of logic really is. Remember, the Fidelity data measures outperformance based on individual one-month periods, and our author has taken this to mean active investors can expect persistent outperformance that will compound over four decades. That is an unforgivable error, especially for someone who's described as a, quote, award-winning investment advisor. If Forbes was subject to peer review like a real academic study, there is no way that statement would have got past even the laziest of referees. It shouldn't have made it past the editors either. Wait till I get going! Where was I? Right. The fine print in the Fidelity presentation goes on to explain that not all funds are considered in this analysis. First, they apply what they call a fee filter that excludes both active and passive funds in the most expensive quartile. In other words, they remove the 25% of funds with the highest fees. Well, that's certainly convenient for anyone who wants to argue that active outperforms passive net of fees. I mean, sure, there are some relatively expensive index funds, but the range of costs is much narrower. So if you remove the 25% of funds with the highest fees in both the active and passive categories, you're clearly creating an enormous bias in favor of active funds. If that weren't enough, Fidelity also applies a rating filter, which excludes funds that received a one or a two star rating from Morningstar in the prior month. If you're not familiar with Morningstar's ratings, they range from one to five stars, with the highest scores going to the best performing funds relative to their peers. Again, this is a methodology that creates an enormous bias in favor of active funds because relatively few index funds ever receive one-star or two-star ratings. After all, by definition, index funds deliver returns very close to those of traditional benchmarks, so it's unusual for them to be well below the majority of their peers. By removing all funds with fewer than three stars, you will increase the average return of the remaining active funds significantly, but the average return of the remaining passive funds would likely see a much smaller improvement. So let's recap this so-called study. The sample included in the analysis are filtered to remove the most expensive funds and those with the worst recent performance. Then, the less expensive and better performing funds are compared to index funds and ETFs over one month periods. The results are presented for 18 categories, though presumably the analysis was done on more categories than that. Then, this is all wrapped up in a bow for a marketing presentation, and the conclusion is, and here I'm just going to crib from the headline of the Forbes article, quote, most index funds and ETFs are not good investments. Doesn't anyone notice this? I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! The lesson here is that whenever you hear somebody make a sweeping claim like, this study shows active investing beats index funds, push back and ask for the details. Most of the time you'll find there is no study, at least not in the academic sense. It's usually just cherry-picked data that an investment firm is using to peddle its own products. And to be fair, you should apply the same scrutiny when people make the claim that indexing is superior to active management. There is a large and compelling body of peer-reviewed academic studies that support that argument, but that doesn't mean that any of us should take every claim for granted. Read the fine print, understand the methodology used, and in cases where people take results way out of context, as this author has done, call it out as... Bad investment advice. And we're going to dive back into the mailbag for our Ask the Spud segment, where we answer questions from listeners and blog readers. Joining me with this month's question, as always, is my colleague, Amanda Diel. 
This time, our question comes from Shiraz, who writes, I'm looking to get into the real estate market by buying a rental property such as a condo, but right now it is a bit of a stretch to come up with a down payment and second mortgage. I wanted to get your thoughts on REITs and whether it makes sense to buy a REIT ETF instead. Okay, thanks Shiraz for this question. I should start by clarifying that a REIT is a real estate investment trust, which is a type of company that owns a portfolio of income generating properties. This can include commercial and retail properties such as shopping malls, as well as office buildings and residential properties including apartment buildings, retirement homes, and so on. The REIT then collects rental income from all of these tenants and passes on a significant portion to its shareholders. So they have a relatively high yield compared with stocks and bonds. Four to six percent is not unusual. The combination of real estate exposure and high yield makes REITs attractive to many investors who are focused on income. Now, of course, traditionally people who want to generate regular monthly income from their investments have also been drawn to rental properties. If you buy a condo and rent it out to a tenant, you can generate consistent monthly cash flow and maybe even enjoy a little price appreciation along the way. And this is what Shiraz is considering. But he has run up against a common problem in Canada these days. Residential real estate, at least in many areas, has become unaffordable. If you're an investor in Toronto or Vancouver and you want to buy a condo as an investment, you're going to need several hundred thousand dollars for a down payment, and a good chunk of your monthly rental income will go towards paying down your mortgage. So it's not surprising that people like Shiraz are looking to REITs instead. All of the major ETF providers in Canada, iShares, Vanguard, and BMO, offer index ETFs that hold a portfolio of REITs. So if you're looking for exposure to income generating real estate, it's much easier and much more liquid to do that by purchasing an ETF rather than a condo. But the problem here is that this really isn't a useful comparison. A lot of investors like to draw a parallel between purchasing a rental property and buying a REIT. Some even discuss the decision to buy REITs in the context of home ownership. I've heard people say, for example, that they would never purchase REITs in their portfolio because they've already got a significant amount of their net worth tied up in their home. Or conversely, renters sometimes argue that they should add REITs to their portfolio so they can get some exposure to real estate since they're not getting that through home ownership. The problem with all of these comparisons is that your home or a rental condo is a single undiversified asset and it is unlikely to have any correlation at all with a portfolio of REITs. Let's consider the iShares S&P TSX capped REIT index ETF, which trades under the ticker symbol XRE. This fund holds 19 individual Canadian REITs and it breaks down to roughly 30% retail, 24% residential, 11% office space, 10% industrial, and then a number of other smaller categories. There must be hundreds, perhaps thousands of individual properties in this portfolio and they will be spread out all over the country. Now, as everyone knows, real estate markets are very local, so price increases or decreases in one area may have little or no effect at all on other areas. So the price of your two-bedroom condo in Calgary has zero correlation with Montreal office towers, a Burnaby shopping center, or a senior's residence in Moncton. That's why I think it's unhelpful to think of this decision as, should I buy a condo or should I buy a REIT ETF? This is really not that much different from saying, should I start my own business or should I buy a broad market equity ETF? Everyone can appreciate that owning one business is fundamentally different from owning a small stake in hundreds or thousands of businesses, but somehow this seems less obvious in the context of real estate. However, it's really no different. So Shiraz, if you're thinking about buying real estate as part of your portfolio, let's ignore REITs for now. This decision should really consider several other factors. The first is how well diversified you are in terms of your overall net worth. For example, consider a couple who live in a condo in downtown Toronto and they own it mortgage free. Now they might be considering purchasing another condo unit, maybe even in the same building, as an investment. But in this case, I would encourage them to consider that they are not very well diversified. A huge amount of their net worth is tied to a very specific real estate market. Any drop in Toronto condo prices could be devastating to their net worth. So they would probably be better off investing in a diversified portfolio of index ETFs, which is likely to have little or no correlation with their other major asset. Another important factor to consider when purchasing a rental property is how attracted you are to the idea of being a landlord. While an income property can provide consistent cash flow, it can be a fairly high maintenance investment, especially compared with a portfolio of index funds, which is never going to call you at 2 o'clock in the morning to say that the toilet is overflowing. 
Finally, if you're considering purchasing a rental property, it's important to have realistic expectations. And this is really the biggest problem I see with budding real estate investors today. Many seem to believe that real estate prices only go up, never down. So even if the rental income you earn isn't quite enough to cover the mortgage and maintenance, well, that's fine because the property will increase in value by 8 to 10% annually. After all, it's gone up by at least that much in many Canadian cities over the last 10 or 15 years. But if those are your expectations, they're likely to end in disappointment. Shiraz, after considering these factors, if you decide that you don't want to be a landlord, I don't think you need to consider investing in a REIT fund as an alternative. Instead, you can simply invest in a traditional portfolio of equity and bond index funds. To hear more about why I don't think it's necessary to add a specific holding in REITs, listen to podcast number 16 where I address this issue in the Ask the Spud segment. Now, a traditional couch potato portfolio probably won't generate as much income as a rental property, but there are ways to generate consistent cash flow from an index portfolio, and they're probably more tax efficient than rental income in any case. If you're interested in learning more, check out an article that I wrote for MoneySense a while back. Just Google MoneySense and a better way to generate retirement income, and you should find it. I'll also include a link to the article on my blog. Thanks, Dan. Remember, if you've got an investing question that you'd like Dan to answer on the podcast, please send it to mail at canadiancouchpotato.com. That does it for this episode of the Canadian Couch Potato Podcast. Thanks to Amanda DL and to our producer Nick Jaworski and to you for listening. Take care till next time.